Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us here in Washington, D.C. today for a conversation with Federal Reserve Chairman Ben Bernanke as he takes questions from teachers about personal finance, the Federal Reserve, and the economy. My name is Rose Pianalto, and I work here at the Board of Governors, and I look forward to moderating today's session. Here in the boardroom of the Federal Reserve, we are pleased to host a group of 60 educators who teach economics and personal finance to young people. We are also joined via video conference by educators from all over the country who are participating in local events at their regional reserve banks and branch offices, as well as many who are viewing this exchange via webcast. Through this session, the Federal Reserve System seeks to advance the conversation about the importance of financial, financial education for young people. We also hope to provide insights into the Federal Reserve's goals and activities so we can support the work you do with students as you strive to teach them how the decisions made by the central bank affect them, their families, and the economy. Throughout our event today, Twitter users can follow the Federal Reserve Board's feed at Federal Reserve and join the discussion about the event by using the hashtag FedTownHall. Today, we are honored to bring you Federal Reserve Chairman Ben Bernanke. Before coming to the Board of Governors in 2002, Chairman Bernanke was a professor of economics and public affairs at Princeton University. He also chaired the Department of Economics from 1996 to 2002. Chairman Bernanke served as a governor of the Federal Reserve System from 2002 to 2005. In 2005, he became the chair of the President's Council of Economic Advisors. He returned to the Federal Reserve as the chairman of the Board of Governors in 2006. Chairman Bernanke grew up in Dillon, South Carolina, and received a BA in economics from Harvard University and a PhD in economics from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. He and his wife, Anna, also an educator, have two children. Thank you for joining us today, Mr. Chairman. Hi, welcome. Welcome to the Federal Reserve. I'm, I'm delighted to have the opportunity to speak with you today uh, with educators throughout the country on the topic of financial education. Thank you for your participation and for the very important work that you do. As an educator myself, I understand the profound effect that good teachers and a quality education have on the lives of our young people. Today, I hope you'll learn from each other and share ways to best promote learning, and in particular, to help students achieve greater financial literacy. Financial education supports not only individual well-being, but also the economic health of our nation. As the recent financial crisis illustrates, consumers who can make informed decisions about financial products and services not only serve their own best interests, but collectively they also help promote broader economic stability. Smart financial planning, such as budgeting, saving for emergencies, and preparing for retirement, can help households enjoy better lives while weathering financial shocks. Financial education can play a key role in getting to these good outcomes. Research by Federal Reserve Board staff members on the effectiveness on of financial education for young military personnel, for example, found that those who had taken a high school financial education course were more likely to save regularly. Effective financial education is not just about teaching students about financial products or about performing financial calculations. It also involves teaching them essential skills and concepts they will need to make major financial choices. High school students might not recall specific information about a lesson from loans a year ago when they go to get their first car loan or their first student loan. However, if they understand and remember some basic ideas, for example, that it's important to shop around for a loan for a low interest rate, to review the fees charged, and to know how to contact financial counselors and advisors they'll be more likely to make a good decision. A particularly valuable lesson we can teach our students is how to apply the economic way of thinking to their decisions. For instance, the topic of student loan debt and whether students are prepared to service that debt upon graduation has received increased attention lately. Students with some exposure to economic thinking will be more likely to conceptualize their spending on post-secondary education 
as an investment in their own human capital and choose their school, course of study, means of paying for their education and profession with that thought in mind. Likewise, the economic tool of cost-benefit analysis should help students make sounder personal and financial decisions. Financial education also provides a context for students to develop important skills that can be applied more broadly. Making good financial decisions requires that consumers seek out relevant information from trustworthy sources and that they use critical thinking, quantitative reasoning, and decision-making skills. These competencies are also some of the fundamental abilities that our schools seek to inculcate in our children. As with other types of education, the format and quality of the content matters a great deal. Providing financial education that is realistic, interesting, and relevant can help students retain information and remain engaged. Games and simulations can be particularly effective at keeping students interested. For example, in 2010, I spoke at the opening of the Junior Achievement Finance Park in Fairfax, Virginia. This organization, as well as similar facilities throughout the country, allows students to play the role of a family head with financial challenges and opportunities, giving them a chance to practice financial decision making in a realistic setting. Students and their parents can become financially literate together through exercises such as intergenerational homework assignments, I love that phrase, which reinforce the concepts taught in class. Such strategies allow educators to help adults who until then may not have been exposed to financial concepts. To provide the most effective education, curriculum should also have clear standards and goals. To that end, the federal government's Financial Literacy and Education Commission, of which the Federal Reserve is a member, has identified five core competencies that should be covered by financial education. Earning an income, spending, saving an investment, borrowing, and protecting. Behind each of these competencies is a set of related knowledge and skills and corresponding behaviors. For example, in the category of earnings and income, students are expected to know the difference between gross pay and net pay, and information about benefits and taxes. With this knowledge, they can understand their pay stubs and take full advantage of workplace benefits. The five core competencies are reflected in the national standards for personal finance being developed by the Council of Economic Education. And several of our Federal Reserve System colleagues are working with the Council on this project. While it's important to begin teaching financial skills to children and teenagers, Achieving and maintaining financial know-how is a lifelong undertaking. The types of financial decisions that people have to make, from paying for school to buying a home to planning for retirement, vary throughout the course of their lives. And thus, we need to ensure that access to financial education is readily available at all stages of life. Moreover, relevant, accurate, and reliable financial information must be readily available to consumers at the very time that they are making their decisions. Given the ubiquity of smartphones, applications for mobile devices may be one effective method of delivering just-in-time information at a relatively low cost. For example, our colleagues at the Department of Treasury are currently running an app contest to design mobile tools to help Americans make better financial choices. Because financially capable consumers ultimately contribute to a stable economic and financial system, as well as improve their own financial situations, it's clear that the Federal Reserve has a significant stake in financial education. We demonstrate our commitment through numerous programs and resources offered by the Federal Reserve System staff and through partnerships our reserve banks have formed with local educators and institutions. For instance, the Federal Reserve Bank of Chicago, during its annual Money Smart Week, conducts free classes and activities to help consumers better manage their personal finances. And the Federal Reserve Bank of St. Louis offers a broad selection of online personal finance courses that teachers can use along with their students. To find out more about what's happening in your area, I encourage you to visit the Federal Reserve System's education website www.federalreserveeducation.org. 
I'd like to thank you again, all of you, for your participation today. It's a great pleasure to be talking to other teachers and people who are working so effectively and importantly with our young people, and I'm looking forward to taking some of your questions. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And now we'll begin taking questions. The first one is from the Miami branch. Okay. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman. My name is Tom Glazer. I teach history, government economics at Madra Academy Charter High School in Hialeah Gardens, Florida. Thank you for this opportunity. Here's my question. What is your view of the current state of government budgets, local, state, and federal, and what are the implications for students and education? Well, you, you've identified a, uh, a key example of uh, trade-offs, which is what economics is all about. Uh, state and local governments have been facing some fiscal challenges for some time, as you know. It's not just something that's happened since the crisis. Uh, maybe some of you are aware of a study that just came out uh, under the auspices of uh, former Fed Chairman Paul Volcker that looked at state and local government uh, finances and found that uh, many uh, governments are uh, finding it very difficult to meet their long-term uh, commitments for pensions uh, and, and uh, other benefits for their, for their workforce. Um, during the recession and the crisis, of course, uh, as the economy contracted, tax revenues fell quite a bit. Um, and states and localities with balanced budget amendments or requirements um, cut back on their spending. And indeed, if you look at employment over the last few years, even as the private sector has been adding jobs, the state and local sector has been subtracting jobs and reducing the overall uh, pace of gains in our labor market. So uh, it's been a very tight and difficult period for state and local governments. Now, on the other side, you have education which is uh, the most basic kind of investment. It's investment in human capital. It's investment in our future. Now, there's lots and lots of evidence that uh, every extra year of education provides extra earning power, extra job satisfaction, and adds to the uh, overall uh, social welfare of the, of the entire economy. Um, so there's a great deal to be gained from, from extra education. Now, an additional complication is, of course, that the quality of education and the amount spent on education are not always exactly correlated. There are many other factors as well, such as uh, parental involvement, uh, community support, uh, quality of teachers, <laughs> types of curriculum, and so on. So it's a very complicated um, relationship. All that being said, and, and understanding very well that uh, state and local governments, uh, while things have been a little better lately, are still under a great deal of budgetary pressure, I hope that in making those decisions and thinking about where to put their limited dollars, that state and local governments will keep in mind um, that we don't want to be eating our seed corn. We want to be making investments in the future, and education is one of the most fundamental investments because it's in our young people who will be, of course, the workers, consumers, and citizens um, in decades ahead. Thank you. Next, we'll go to Cleveland. Peterson from Mentor and I teach economics to students at Mentor High School. And uh, my question, uh, Mr. Chairman, how does the Fed maintain the delicate balance between not having political party leanings or pressures, and yet at the same time offer the best objective financial leadership for our country? It's a good question. Um, one of the uh, basic findings of research about central banks is that it really helps an economy to have a strong and independent central bank. And what I mean by that is a central bank that can make monetary policy and other decisions without being influenced by short-term political pressures. The research shows that countries with independent central banks have lower inflation, they have more stable economies, um, and overall more confidence in their currency and so on. So it's very important to have that degree of independence. The reason for this is because monetary policy tends to work with a lag. It takes time for the full effects of monetary policy to be felt. And therefore, uh, you want decisions about monetary policy to be made by people who are not looking at the short run, not looking at the election a few months down the road, but are looking at the longer term and saying what's right for the economy. So independent central banks are very important. Now, there's a quid pro quo for that, though. We're yet, we are in a democracy, and obviously um, uh, the central bank, the Federal Reserve of the United States, 
has to be accountable, has to be transparent, has to be following a framework given to it by the Congress, and that's, of course, what we do. Um, we are indeed nonpartisan. We do try to make all of our decisions based on uh, technical analysis, based on what's good for the economy, not based on any political considerations. This is the table, by the way, you're sitting here, where we have the Federal Open Market Committee meetings and make decisions about monetary policy. And there is never any discussion around this table about political issues. It's always about where is the economy, where is it going? But given that we are independent and there are uh, a lot of provisions, such as the fact that uh, governors are appointed for 14 years, for example, um, and that the term of the chairman uh, goes across presidential uh, terms, uh, so there are many provisions that give the Federal Reserve a good bit of independence in decision making. But the quid pro quo for that is that we have to be accountable. And we are very accountable by law. I testify twice a year uh, in front of the House and the Senate to explain what monetary policy is doing. And I actually testify many more times than that. Um, our Federal Open Market Committee meetings are followed by a statement three weeks later by detailed minutes. Uh, we provide quarterly projections. I give a quarterly press conference. I meet regularly with people both from the Congress and from the administration. So I'm very responsive personally to um, people in the government. Um, and so for all those reasons, um, we, we try very hard to make sure that we explain what we're doing and that the, and that the uh, elected, uh, uh, the elected uh, folks who are, who are in the Congress or administration uh, can appreciate what we're, we're trying to do. So that's, that's the balance that we try to achieve. Independence in order to make good decisions, but accountability and transparency to make that independence consistent with our democratic framework. Thank you. Now we'll go to Houston. I'm Alice Purcell with First Baptist Christian Academy in Pasadena. Uh, Chairman Bernanke, what effect is the euro crisis having on the U.S. economy? And what would a centralized European fiscal policy, um, what effect would that have on the global economy? That's a, that's a, that, that, you have about an hour? <laughs> uh, <laughs> Well, the European situation is very difficult. I mean, the basic problem there is that, like the states of the United States, they have a single monetary policy. There's one central bank, the European Central Bank, that makes uh, monetary policy for all 17 nations in the Eurozone. But unlike the states of the United States, they don't have one fiscal policy. Each country has its own parliament, its own prime minister, and its own fiscal policy. So it is as if, in the United States, uh, during a downturn, um, individual states know that the federal government is there to pay Social Security, to pay Medicare, to provide uh, defense, all of those uh, broad government functions, and each state and locality only has to deal with its more local services that it provides. In, in Europe, each country is basically responsible for its own uh, uh, fiscal situation. Now, since there are some countries that are weaker fiscally and they're involved in um, uh, tightening their belts very, uh, in a very um, strong way, the results of that are um, uh, weaker economies in those countries. And indeed, most of Europe is now um, suffering a much weaker economy. On top of that, uh, their banking system is, uh, is been stressed by the fact that banks hold a lot of sovereign government debt, uh, which in turn is hurting the financial positions of the banks and reducing the amount of lending they're willing to do. So uh, the European... Uh, continent and particularly the eurozone; those 17 countries that share the, the euro are under a lot of a uh, lot of uh, economic and financial stress. Um, there's been a lot of uh, steps taken to try to address that by European leaders. They have a very strong um, incentive to address these problems. They want to maintain the political integrity, the the uh, European collaboration that's been going on now since uh, uh, almost since World War II. Uh, but it is very difficult and involves many, many uh, tough political choices. Um, the effects on the United States are pretty significant. Um, there are two basic types of channels by which the euro crisis is affecting us. First, um, Europe is a major export destination for U.S. firms. So a weaker European economy means that both U.S. exporters and exporters from other countries are finding weaker markets, and that is reducing demand for our products and, and slowing our economy. 
Uh, probably even more important is the fact that concerns about the European situation have created lots of stress and volatility in financial markets, in the stock market, in credit markets, um, and uh, those, uh, those problems are affecting us uh, here in the United States as well. So between the financial effects and the trade effects, um, the European crisis is slowly, slowing um, our economy. Of course, there are many other factors affecting the U.S. economy as well, including uh, fiscal uh, issues, um, credit tightness, uh, the housing market, and so on. But this is one of the, the European situation is one of the factors that's uh, slowing the, the economic recovery. You asked about what would happen if Europe uh, had a single fiscal, um, a single fiscal authority that would put them in a much closer situation relative to the United States that would probably uh, address uh, many of the concerns, many of the problems that they have. But getting to that point is very difficult because, again, you have 17 different countries and each, uh, each set of taxpayers wants to make sure that their own country is uh, being fairly treated. And so it's a very difficult, complex uh, political negotiation that's been going on now for a couple of years. Okay, um, let's go to DC for, for the next question. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman. My name is Jennifer Walker, and I teach comparative politics and economics at Sherwood High School in Sandy Spring, Maryland. My question for you is, how can we as educators emphasize the importance of understanding how the invisible hand led to our current crisis, while at the same time encourage students to believe that the market can work? So I think one of the most uh, exciting moments in teaching economics is when kids understand the invisible hand idea, the idea that markets can achieve such complex economic outcomes without any kind of central planning. I think Milton Friedman, I think, had, a, had the example of saying, think how complicated it is to deliver a pencil. You think of all the components, you know, the, 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 the wood and the, and the rubber and the metal and the graphite and paint and everything else and delivery and assembly, and you get a pencil for a dollar or whatever it is it cost. Um, and markets can do that because um, uh, the invisible hand says that even though each participant is um, uh, working for their own interest only and there's no central planner uh, involved, that uh, markets uh, still work somehow to deliver that, uh, that result. And indeed, there's a lot of evidence, I think it's pretty clear to everybody, that looking around the world that uh, markets um, have played a tremendous role in creating the wealth that we see in rich countries and in emerging markets that are, are um, becoming rich. So markets are uh, an amazing thing, and um, getting students to appreciate uh, what markets can do is, is a very important part of uh, teaching economics. Now, that being said, um, the next level up um, is to understand that markets also have problems, that there are market failures, there's monopoly, there's externalities, there's many other things that can um, go wrong in markets, and understanding what, uh, how to fix those problems is really an important key to thinking about economic policy in general. Now, in the financial crisis, there were a number of places where markets or the combination of markets and government uh, failed. Um, for example, uh, basic invisible hand economics assumes that information is perfect, that everybody understands basically what they're buying and what they're selling. Um, that wasn't always true, obviously, in the crisis when people were buying um, uh, complicated credit instruments that contained uh, a variety of substandard uh, credit products like subprime mortgages. Um, and the people who bought that uh, didn't necessarily understand everything that was in those, uh, was in, in those credit products. Likewise, during the crisis, there was huge uncertainty about you know, which banks and which financial institutions were uh, in danger because it was very hard to know what the exposures were and what, um, what each uh, institution held and what the risks were. Um, another issue related to financial markets is that uh, unlike most industries, financial markets are prone to runs. That is, if people lose confidence in um, a particular institution or even in a broad set of institutions, and they are providing short-term deposits or short-term funding to those institutions, they have an incentive to run and pull out their money as quickly as possible. And if everybody does that, it's like everybody running for the exit in a crowded theater, then uh, you know, nobody's better off. What happens is that you create huge stress in the financial system. And trying to address the problem of runs and instability 
is in fact why the Federal Reserve was created in almost 100 years ago to, to provide uh, support for the financial system during periods of, of crisis. Uh, finally, I'd mentioned the too big to fail problem, which is a sort of a combination of government and market failure. Um, institutions which are so big and complex and interconnected that their failure would uh, possibly bring down the financial system, there is a strong presumption in the markets that the government will protect those institutions. And that means that the market is not allowed to work in a sense because people who lend money to those institutions are saying, well, I don't have to worry about whether they're making good investments or taking too much risk because I believe that if they get into trouble, the government will protect them. That obviously leads to very bad allocations. It leads to increased risk in the system. So, there, so to answer your question, I already lost a chance to answer your question quickly. So let me, <laughs> let me, let me uh, close by just saying that Markets are a wonderful thing, and it's important to understand that, but the financial crisis showed there are some ways in which markets don't always work well. And, um, uh, you know, it's, it's just as important to understand that markets can fail as it is to understand that markets are powerful and can give uh, good results a lot of the time. Okay, now let's see if we can go back to Omaha and pick up from there. Omaha? Great. Right. Good afternoon, sir. I'm Carol Mathias from Lincoln Northeast High School. Economics and current events go together. So what current events would you consider essential that we cover in the classroom? And as a follow-up to that, after with everything that's going on in the world, do you see any events on the horizon that teachers should be aware of and ready to talk with students about? Well, we certainly have had a lot of things happening in the economy in recent years, um, and I think students want to understand, you know, what what they see around them, what they read in the paper, what they hear. I guess they don't read paper. Sorry, what they <laughs> what they hear on their iPhone. Um, uh, so, you know, what we've seen recently includes, of course, the financial crisis, um, uh, a very complex event, but certain parts of it can be explained. Can explain what a bank run is. Um, you can explain um, the problems with, uh, with subprime mortgages, for example, which ties into financial literacy type issues that we talked about. So financial crisis is clearly something that um, uh, kids would probably want to understand, and the recession that followed that as well. Um, surely they want to understand about uh, monetary and fiscal policy. What is the Federal Reserve? What does it do? Um, how is monetary policy being used in the current uh, situation? Uh, fiscal policy is something that affects their lives in quite concrete ways. Um, decisions are being made about the long-term future of uh, Social Security, for example, who's going to pay and who's going to benefit. That has a big effect on, on, on uh, kids' futures. Um, so those are the kinds of things that can interest them. You raised the, someone raised the question just a few moments ago about Europe. Uh, that's also something that's in the, the news, and I know that... Uh, um, uh, People are interested in understanding what's going on there. Now, these are all complex uh, issues, and probably a complete analysis is going to be uh, tough to put into a class. But there are many elements and aspects that you can use to try to give a better sense of what's happening uh, in these uh, situations. I think going forward, there, there are many things you can look at from, uh, you know, there's both microeconomics and macroeconomics. At the microeconomic level, uh, issues of uh, pollution control. Um, and, and perhaps uh, uh, global, uh, I mean, uh, global warming uh, interest students. You know, what are the economics of that? What are the economics of the demographics of our societies getting older? And what are the implications of that for our economy and for our, our young people's futures? Um, I think an interesting question you might think about right now is, why do countries compete to have the Olympics in their <laughs> in their country? Is it an economically a sensible thing to do? Or is it just for national pride, basically? Um, so there are lots and lots of issues. Just you know, look, out, look out the window. You'll find things to talk about. And see what the students themselves raise, because uh, they've heard things on the, on the, in the media. And uh, they'll, they'll raise questions themselves. Thank you. And now we'll, uh, we'll go to Philadelphia. Mr. Chairman, my name, is, my name is David Hillink. I teach at Germantown Academy in Fort Washington, Pennsylvania. 
My question for you is uh, about the Federal Reserve System itself. I'm wondering what you think uh, young people most need to know about the Federal Reserve and how it operates. Well, the first thing they should know is what it is. <laughs> uh, the uh, Federal Reserve is, of course, a very important economic institution. And um, I think every informed citizen should know at least the basics of what the Fed is and how it's structured and what it does. Um, a, a good economics class is going to take students a little further. It's going to explain uh, what, what is monetary policy and how does it work. I think a very basic thing that um, often gets lost is the difference between monetary policy and fiscal policy. Monetary policy is the responsibility of the Fed. Fiscal policy is the responsibility of the Congress and the administration. Those are very different. They work in different ways, and there are different sets of responsibilities there. So uh, understanding the distinction between those things, uh, I think, is very important. Um, the Fed is also a regulator, and the, the fact that um, along with other banking regulators, we oversee banks, um, try to help control the risks that they take and try to help maintain their stability. But why is that and you know, what, uh, what economic role does that play? Now, all of that would probably have been sufficient a few years ago, but you know, recently, uh, and now I'm getting into the AP class, um, <laughs> a lot of other things have happened. The Fed has done things that it hadn't done for a long time. Uh, for example, over the last few years, we have been trying to um, use monetary policy to support the economy, but it was, in our, it was already almost uh, four years or three and a half years since, since um, uh, the interest rate, uh, the federal funds rate, went almost to zero, and we've been using um, other kinds of monetary policy uh, involving the purchases of, of longer-term uh, treasury securities, for example. So instead of buying short-term securities, which is the traditional way of doing monetary policy, we're now doing longer-term asset purchases. Um, so kids will want to, you know, a, a, an advanced class certainly would want to understand uh, how monetary policy can be conducted even when short-term interest rates are close to zero. The other thing which is very important, and I think uh, there will be a lot of broad interest in this, um, the Federal Reserve was founded, as I mentioned before, uh, in large part to deal with financial crises, to uh, be available to support the financial system during periods of panic and to try to stabilize the financial system. Um, this, uh, this function uh, got a lot less attention during most of the post-war period, uh, and most people began to think about the Fed as primarily a monetary policy institution. But obviously, with the crisis that we've had recently and uh, crises in other parts of the world, um, central banks have become much more engaged in supporting a financial system, creating financial stability. And explaining that basic function, I think, is also very important. So to summarize, basic structure and governance, uh, monetary policy, distinction between monetary and fiscal policy, those are the basics. Those, I think, are what uh, every citizen needs to know. And then the most recent few years, the Fed has done um, new things, including uh, buying longer-term securities in order to provide more monetary policy support and working to stabilize our financial system. Those are more complex subjects, but also uh, of, I think, great interest. OK, now we're going to go to Los Angeles. Here we go. Hi, uh, Mr. Bernanke. I'm Diane Larson, and I teach economics, business economics, and business law at Modern Day High School, Santa Ana, California. And I have this question for you. What do you believe is the best way to anticipate and prevent another financial crisis similar to the one that started in 2008? Thank you. How to anticipate and prevent a, a financial crisis. Um, <laughs> <laughs> another easy question. Well, um, uh, obviously, given the cost of the last financial crisis, we'd like to do all we can to <laughs> anticipate and prevent an, if, if another financial crisis. And if one happens, to mitigate its effects as much as possible. I would say, broadly speaking, that the, the new regulatory structures, both the Dodd-Frank Act, the Basel Accord, and other parts, had, is, is really a two-part strategy, if I might. Uh, the first is that. Um, we are now taking, when I say we, I mean the financial regulators, the government in general, 
are now taking a sort of a more system or systemic approach. That is, before the crisis, every uh, regulator had its own particular institution, particular market that it was responsible for, and nobody was there watching the system as a whole. Um, the idea that, uh, in fact, that regulators ought to work together to identify risks in the broader system, uh, which is called macroprudential regulation, um, was discussed even before the crisis, but it is now, I think, part of what uh, the new regulatory structure is trying to accomplish. So we have, for example, something called the Financial Stability Oversight Council, known lovingly around here as FSOC, uh, which is, consists of uh, 10 major regulators, including the Federal Reserve, as well as some other um, regulators who, who don't have votes, including state and local uh, state regulators. Um, the FSOC's job is to uh, to look at the system as a whole, to try to identify problems, to see if there are uh, risks that may threaten uh, the system, are there weaknesses in the structure of the system, are there gaps in regulation that need to be addressed. Um, the Federal Reserve has its own Office of Financial Stability, which we created uh, since the crisis, which has a similar function, again, to try to monitor the whole system, to try to identify problems that um, might be arising. And we work closely with the FSOC to to look for new problems, to try to see where there might be um, uh, the next crisis might be coming from, and to take steps to uh, at least to uh, provide a warning so that we can uh, collectively address, address those problems. So that's the first part, which is to have a macroprudential approach, which is looking at the system as a whole, is trying to identify gaps and weaknesses and fix those if possible. Now, we know perfectly well that we won't be able to identify every problem that comes along. Uh, the uh, issues are very complex, and historically, uh, it just happens that, you know, very often that uh, neither the private sector nor the public sector identifies a problem until it's already upon us. So the second part of the um, strategy is to make the system itself as resilient as possible. So whatever happens, even if we don't identify it or prevent it, the system will be stronger and able to uh, survive and, and continue to provide credit uh, even in the face of a shock. So there are many aspects of that. Uh, one example would be the new capital standards that have been agreed upon by not just the United States, but, but essentially all the major countries in the world, so-called Basel III capital standards. What they would do is increase the amount of reserves capital that banks have very substantially. And that means is that when banks, whenever, whatever may happen, if banks take significant losses uh, relative to where they were before the last crisis, they'll have lots of capital which can absorb those losses and prevent uh, those losses from turning into a, a failure or to a broader uh, banking panic. So greater capital, uh, stronger rules on derivatives trading, more liquidity for banks so they have enough cash on hand to meet uh, withdrawals, all of those things are intended to make the system stronger, so no matter what may happen, and it's certainly going to be something we don't anticipate, the system will be better prepared to absorb the shock without going into crisis, as we saw in 2008. Thank you. And now, uh, now a question from St. Louis. Hi, my name is Jennifer McElady, and I work for Special School District of St. Louis County, and I work with Normandy High School math students. My question, Mr. Chairman, should the public school system add more courses such as economics and finance to the curriculum? Well, we're all in favor of that. <laughs> um, so there are lots of ways to do that. I, I mean, I think it's clearly good to have, as I said at the beginning, it's really good to have um, students uh, be able to understand the basics of, of economics and finance and financial literacy. Um, but there are lots of ways to do it. Um, I mean, one way to do it is if, if your high school has AP courses, there are AP courses uh, in microeconomics and macroeconomics, and students who want to do that can, can do college uh, preparatory work in economics. And so you can do uh, pretty significant, pretty serious economics courses if you want. But I say that because there are lots of other ways to incorporate economics. Um, when I took uh, history in high school, I said, well, this is all about kings and queens and wars. 
And uh, there must be other things to life than that. And of course there is, uh, you know, economics uh, tells how people actually live, how they make a living, how societies function, how markets function, trade, all those aspects of history which are so important. Um, so in integrating economics into your history, inter integrating economics into um, civics so that students understand uh, the importance of institutions like uh, the Federal Reserve and regulators and fiscal policy and so on. Um, uh, then, of course, beyond that is financial literacy, which is so very important for all students. I don't think there are any students who should not be exposed to at least basic financial literacy concepts. That can be done as an individual course, as a part of a course, um, maybe combined with something like the Junior Achievement Program that I mentioned, which is a very uh, good way to get kids interested. Um, or it can be integrated into uh, consumer math or to a math class or other kinds of uh, uh, contexts. So there are many ways to do it. It depends on your resources and the kinds of uh, interests that uh, students have. But um, if you think about what people do every day, what, uh, what adults are required to do in terms of their managing their finances and um, uh, preparing for retirement and all those things, the economics and financial literacy are just uh, critical parts of education, and there are lots of ways to incorporate it, and I hope that everyone here will do that. I assume that you're here because you're interested in doing that, and I congratulate you for that and encourage you to um, keep making that effort. And now we'll take a question from Boston. in Danvers, Mass. Could you share your thoughts on the current crisis regarding the current level of student loan debt? And how might the burden of current student loan debts for our young people impact the economy in the future if these same borrowers are not in a position to borrow for goods such as housing and automobiles or for starting up new businesses? Well, student loan debt, which is now one of the largest categories of debt of any type at this point, uh, is kind of a two-edged sword. On the one hand, um, education is an investment. It's an investment in human capital. And it's, as I mentioned before, a very important uh, way of, of uh, increasing your earning power. Um, and we don't want to have a world in which talented students are unable to uh, get additional education because they can't afford it. So having a student debt market or a student debt program uh, allows people who don't have the money uh, still to get the education and to benefit from that and, and it helps everybody uh, if students uh, go on and get additional preparation. So it's very important to have this kind of institution. Now as I said, it's a two-edged sword. On the other hand, if people make bad choices, they can end up being burdened with student debt, large amounts of it, uh, which is not even, as you may know, you can't even discharge student debt in bankruptcy. I mean, basically you've got it. Uh, so uh, if you acquire a lot of debt, but you find that, you know, the schooling you got doesn't really prepare you for, um, uh, for uh, a, a, a good job, you know, then you're, you're really in trouble because you, have, you don't have the income, but you have the debt. So um, what I think I would first advise on that is that um, just like any other investment, if you, when you're investing in your own human capital, you got to be smart. You got to make smart investments. You got to know what it is you're buying. Um, those of you who do guidance counseling type work, uh, think of it as being investment advisor. You're trying to explain to the student, uh, uh, you know, what kind of job or career are you expect to get out of your additional education. Uh, what are the graduation rates? What are the job finding rates for this particular institution? What kinds of income can you expect to earn? And does all of this make sense, given how much debt you have to take? Now, of course, that's not the only reason people take out debt and go get additional education. There's lots of reasons, personal and other reasons, to get more schooling. But if you're thinking about it purely as an economic uh, proposition, um, uh, it's important to understand what it is you're buying. and Are you making a good investment? So uh, counseling, I think, should be an important part of the decision-making process for kids uh, taking out student debt because it does stick around for a long time. Um, so in terms of the economy, um, you know, I think the, uh, the main issues there are 
really uh, fiscal issues. Um, most government, uh, sorry, most student debt is now provided by the federal government, and so whatever losses or problems there may be on that side will be fiscal problems. That will, losses will be borne by the taxpayer ultimately, um, and there are also the issues again of students being um, burdened by debt if they don't use it in a smart way to get themselves a uh, kind of income they need to, to pay it off. So burden on future consumers uh, and, and fiscal burdens for future taxpayers, those are some of the reasons to try to use debt wisely. I don't think that uh, student debt is, is a, um, again, you never know, but I don't think it's a uh, financial stability issue to the same extent that, say, mortgage debt was in the last crisis because most of it is held not by financial institutions but by the federal government. Great. Okay, now we'll take a question from uh, Chicago. Hello, this is Helen Roberts from the University of Illinois at Chicago Center for Economic Education. So I teach all ages. There's widespread misunderstanding about how the Federal Reserve supports the economy and the short run and long run effects of monetary policy. Students sometimes think of the Fed as being in a in a position to solve all economic problems. And then some also believe that the Federal Reserve is not doing enough to fix the economy. And they blame it for addressing problems that really are the responsibility of fiscal policy. What do you think the Federal Reserve needs to do to educate the public, along with us, about the limits of monetary policy so that people have more realistic expectations? Well, your basic point is absolutely right. The Federal Reserve is an important uh, economic policy institution, monetary policy, as well as financial regulation, have very important roles to play in providing a, a stable economy, uh, stability involving both uh, stability in terms of growth and employment and stability in terms of prices. Um, but as I've often said, monetary policy is not a panacea. It doesn't solve all problems. Um, there are many, many issues that are more appropriately dealt with um, by the fiscal authorities uh, through tax policy or through spending decisions. Um, and beyond that, there are decisions made by uh, uh, trade policy makers, um, education policy makers, all the different areas of economic policy. Um, I think it should be a basic um, part of uh, civics or government or whatever you know heading you put that under that uh, students understand uh, that the government is not just uh, the Congress administration. There's all, there are many other institutions, um, including the Federal Reserve, but including uh, regulators as well. And to have a sense of what these uh, institutions do and how they divide their responsibilities, uh, I think is very basic, very basic bit of economic uh, education. Uh, we've been sort of putting together in this discussion two kinds of financial and economic education is sort of the personal type of education where understanding better um, how the stock market works may help you make better investments and better financial decisions. But there's also the kinds of um, uh, education that involves uh, understanding how our society works to make you a better citizen and a better, uh, better able to understand what's happening in world events. And this is certainly in that latter category um, a basic understanding of modern government involves understanding the principal uh, economic uh, policy uh, institutions and their division of labor. Monetary policy, again, as you say, is um, very important. Uh, it's the Federal Reserve is the primary institution involved in that. It has the important role of providing long-term um, <coughs> stability in, in prices, that is, uh, low inflation. It can be very helpful in... in, in um, helping to restore uh, uh, full employment uh, in, by providing support for a recovery. But in particular, the long-term types of things like providing a strong educational system, providing a good tax code, um, creating free trade, uh, helping unemployed workers gain skills that they need, and so on and so on. There's so many of these things which are really um, responsibilities of a wide variety of economic policy makers together with, in many cases, together with the private sector, working with the private sector. So um, I basically agree with your point that um, it's important for students to understand 
who does what and what the different types of policy can achieve. Thank you um, for that question. And now we'll go to Minneapolis. Okay, Minneapolis, Sorry. we can't hear you. Good afternoon, so. Mr. Chairman. Okay, ah. good. We can hear you now. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman. My name is Al Amdahl. I teach uh, economics and government in Albany. And many of us work hard to teach the importance of saving and investing, yet interest rates of return are at historic lows. How can we teach students that they will be rewarded for saving, given that returns on investments are currently so low? Oh, good question. Um, so obviously interest rates are very low. Uh, they're low for a good reason, I would want to say, <laughs> which is that um, uh, our economy is, uh, is still uh, in a fragile recovery. And uh, low interest rates are intended to help the economy recover and to re restore more normal levels of employment um, and growth in our, in our economy. Um, for, it, for savers, for investors, it is essential that um, the economy be strong overall. If you think about what investors invest in, some of it, of course, is in fixed, so-called fixed income instruments like, uh, like certificates of deposit or government bonds. But a lot of what people invest in are stocks and, and corporate debt and uh, small businesses and a variety of other kinds of assets. And those assets are not going to perform well unless the economy is strong. So the kind of return that you can get as an investor and as a saver uh, depends on having a strong economy. And there's really no shortcut to that. And that's the reason why we have uh, low interest rates now as a way of trying to restore that vitality that will make, uh, uh, inv give investors higher returns in the future. So that's the reason that rates are low, but of course they are low. That being said, I think that um, there's an awful lot that can be taught. Um, even with rates being low, there's still many incentives uh, to save if you want to buy a house. Uh, now, since the financial crisis, down payment requirements are much higher than they were. You can't get by with no down payment in most cases. Um, uh, if you want to go to uh, college and increase your uh, earning power, um, if you want to retire, it, all the many uh, uh, things that people want to plan for over their, over their lives still require uh, saving. Um, so, in fact, you probably have to save more with rates low in order to get to a certain point. Um, and there's a lot to be learned about it because, for example, uh, if you're going to be saving, you don't, again, don't want to save in just one form. You want to uh, diversify. You want to save in different types of assets. You need to understand the trade-off between risk and return. Um, you need to understand how uh, taxes affect the returns of different types of assets. So um, there's a great deal to be learned about how to save and how to invest, even in a low interest rate environment. Um, and uh, uh, I think students uh, find it pretty interesting um, to uh, have, for example, a um, make-believe portfolio, make their investments, and they can check the paper every morning and see how they did. And they may learn that um, uh, putting all their eggs in one basket may not be the best idea. And so there are many basic ideas like diversification and risk, and, uh, and risk reduction that uh, uh, students can learn and would enjoy learning. Okay, we have one final question, and once again, we'll go to a teacher from the Richmond District who is here in the room with us. So, Mary? Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman. My name is Mary Larson. I'm from Oak Knoll Middle School in Hanover County, Virginia. And we hear that this upcoming generation is going to be the first generation of Americans who are going to be worse off than their parents. I'm a middle school teacher, and my kids hear this, but middle schoolers think they're invincible. Everything is far away. They think we're ancient. So two questions. Number one, do you agree? Do you think that this generation will not be better off than their parents? And the second one is, if your own kids were middle schoolers today, what would you ask their teachers to do to help to impart this important information to them? Yet another very good question. Um, <laughs> so uh, nobody can predict the future, obviously. All kinds of things can happen in the world. Um, but my best guess is that our kids will be better off than we are. And there are a number of reasons for that. Um, the first is that uh, living standards depend 
most fundamentally of all the various things uh, that determine living standards, the most fundamental is gains in productivity. And we, we're living in a world of technological change, and the United States is at the forefront of that. We have, um, we have um, some of the greatest universities in the world here, and we are doing pretty well at finding ways to um, commercialize the inventions and discoveries that are coming out of those universities in places like uh, Silicon Valley and Research Triangle and, 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 and Washington, D.C. area as well. Uh, so technology will continue and provide new opportunities. Um, and the U.S. economy is well placed to, um, uh, to take advantage of that. We have a very entrepreneurial culture. We have a lot of uh, market-oriented, um, uh, our ethos is very market-oriented. We have flexible capital and labor markets. Um, there are, uh, again, I, I guess I would come back to one issue which uh, cuts both ways, which is our demographics. So one of the challenges that we face uh, collectively is the fact that we're, our society is getting older. And the fraction of people who are um, retired and receiving Social Security or Medicare is, is, is increasing. And that creates fiscal burdens and burdens on future taxpayers. The sort of good news is that relative to most other industrial countries, and indeed compared even to some emerging market economies, the demographics of the United States are actually not that bad. We have uh, a very healthy immigration rate. We have a, a healthy fertility rate. And so um, our demographics are actually uh, relatively favorable compared to a number of other industrial countries. And that's another positive. So there are a lot of reasons to think that our society will be transformed by uh, new technologies, new products, new markets, that the United States will play an important role in that, and that will give opportunities for our children uh, to uh, have higher standards of living um, than, uh, than, than we did. Now, there's certainly some very important challenges. Um, I already mentioned the fiscal challenges. Our educational system, we need to keep improving it because now it's, it's not even a question of it, it, the, our educational system is both failing, uh, uh, it's failing many of our students to some degree, but it's, it's, it's creating a lot of inequality also because you have some very good schools in the United States and some that are very poor, and that creates a very different starting line for, for, for kids who are um, coming out of those different uh, uh, backgrounds. Um, so uh, education, healthcare, fiscal, there are a lot of issues that we have. And in the near term, of course, um, uh, kids coming out of uh, high school or college right now are not facing a particularly good job market, and that's going to uh, make it harder for them to get into the workforce and to gain experience and so on. So there are lots of challenges. I don't want to deny that. But again, I think that over the medium term, medium and longer term, the, the intrinsic um, features of the U.S. economy, which have made it uh, the richest economy in the world, uh, together with the ongoing improvements in technology, uh, and the strengths we have in terms of our markets and our demography, all those things are going to be positive. Now, in terms of advice, I think that um, th the way the world is going towards a more globalized system where trade and services can flow very easily across borders um, to a highly technological society, um, the benefits of education are going to get greater and greater. This is not going to be a kind of world in which an unskilled worker is going to do well. You need to have enough um, knowledge, enough uh, particularly of technology, but just broadly that you can adapt and uh, accommodate the um, many changes that are happening and will happen uh, in coming years. So um, the good news for you is that your product is becoming more and more valuable, <laughs> and, uh, and people who are smart will take uh, every possible advantage of it. Thank you. Well, thank you for all your great questions. Uh, that concludes our session for today. Um, we hope you have gained insights from this conversation that will help you in your work in the field of economic and personal finance education. And on behalf of the Federal Reserve System, thank you especially to the participating teachers. We are really pleased you could join us today. And once again, we would just like to thank Chairman Bernanke for taking the time to speak with us today. Thank you. Mr.